Welcome everyone. At the outset, I, on behalf of the KKHSU Constitution Day Celebration Committee 2023, would like to extend a warm and hearty welcome to all present here with us for today's online talk on the Constitution of India and rationalism, which is being organized by Hujja Kumar Bhunia School of Social Sciences, KKHSOU, to mark the occasion of Constitution Day 2023. As you are all aware, Constitution Day is observed and celebrated annually across the length and breadth of the nation to commemorate the adoption of the fundamental governing document of our country, namely the Constitution of India on 26th November 1949 by the Constituent Assembly. I'm happy to inform you that, at, that as in the previous years, this year too, the KK Handik State Open University proudly joins the nation in celebrating Constitution Day at the university, though this time around, the occasion is being observed belatedly since 26th and 27th, 27th of November 2023 happen to be weekly and national holidays respectively, with 28th November, that is today, being the next working day. In this context, I take immense pleasure in stating that today we have in our midst noted educationist and political scientist, former registrar of KKHSOU, and presently professor in public administration at Assam Don Bosco University, Professor Orubjuti Sodori Sir, who shall be delivering today's talk on the theme, the Constitution of India and rationalism. I take this opportunity to welcome you, sir, to our university. And I also wish to sincerely thank you for being with us today to enlighten, to enlighten us on uh, such an important topic. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you. May I now request the chairperson of the KKHSOU Constitution Celebration Committee and director, Pujya Kumar Bhuya School of Social Sciences, KKHSOU, Professor Joydeep Borua, sir, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Can you hear? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Uh, I take the honor and privilege of welcoming everyone to this online talk on Constitution of India and Rationalism by Professor Orubjiji Chaudhuri, who is now Professor in Public Administration at Assam Don Bosco University, uh, who also been registered of this university uh, recently retired from university. He is an eminent scholar and also a very excellent speaker. And I believe that this is going to be a treat for all of us. Now, it is needless to stress on the fact that Constitution of India is one of the most foundational uh, things of our de democracy. And we are living through different periods of crisis. And this, the values which are essentially integrated to the constitution are guiding all of us out of those crises in the past. And we hope that this is going to be the case in the future as well. Uh, I also welcome our, all our online participants, our teachers, our students and other interested audience who are here to listen to Professor Chaudhuri's lecture. And I believe that this is going to be one of the most illuminating talks we will be probably witnessing and hearing. I do not want to take much of time. I uh, once again welcome our Chaudhuri sir to deliver the talk and I hand over the mic to Ovidit to take this program forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, we would now actually like to play a short video on the adoption of the Constitution of India by the Constituent Assembly, courtesy of Rajya Sabha TV. Mitu Mani, please uh, play the video.
people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic. The question is that the constitution settled by this assembly be passed. The motion is adopted. Tariq 26 November 1949. Bharat ka samvidhan swikar hua. 1946 में ब्रिटिश शासन ने भारत को आजादी देने के लिए गंभीरता से सोचना शुरू कर दिया था इसकी शुरुआत हुई ब्रिटिश शासन के कैबिनेट मिशन को भारत भेजे जाने से कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन फॉर इंडिया शुड बी एंड कैन बी फ्रेम्ड ओनली बाय इंडियन साल 1946 में ही कैबिनेट मिशन प्लान के तहत संविधान सभा का गठन किया गया डॉक्टर राजेंद्र प्रसाद को इसका सभापति और डॉक्टर बी आर अम्बेडकर को अध्यक्ष नियुक्त किया गया दिसंबर 1946 को पहली बार संविधान And points to the way which we are going to trek. ये बैठ के दो साल एक ग्यारह महीने और अठारह दिन चली. On the 26th January 1950, India would be a democratic nation. In the sense that India from that day would have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. और कुछ यू बना भारत का अपना संविधान request our esteemed speaker professor arup jyoti choudhary sir to kindly deliver his talk over to you sir thank you okay, very very good morning to all of you good morning sir professor jaydeep porwa director of the school and the chairperson of the organizing committee dr abhijit is the convener of the committee organizing the event deans and directors esteemed faculty and the students uh, for me it's a kind of homecoming although digital in nature it's a kind of digital homecoming uh, since my term was over on 26th of august uh, this is the first kind of homecoming on my part i am very happy that way and i am grateful to the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to be here in the midst of my family members today i propose to share a few thoughts of mine uh with my family members regarding the constitution of india i would like to relate constitutionalism to that of rationalism as such frankly speaking when we put this idea together there may be many eyebrows raised 
as to what is the apparent connection between the two. One is a purely political legal concept of constitution and constitutionalism. And the other is the psychological domain of rationalism. Anyway, I would like to proceed with first a small reference to constitution, then a reference to constitutionalism, and then I would like to relate the whole idea of constitution and constitutionalism to that of rationalism as such. And what is rationalism in this particular context? Now you see, when we say a constitution, we all know it is a fundamental document of governance by which a country is governed. Almost every country in the world, except I suppose Great Britain, it does not have a constitution. So, very briefly speaking, a constitution is a document fundamental in nature in terms of governance of a country. And almost all countries in the world have experienced the functioning of a constitution today. <clears throat> we all know we have a constitution here in India, in, in US, in France, in our neighboring countries, in Indian subcontinent, everywhere there is a constitution. Now the second aspect is, simply because of the fact that you have a constitution, that does not mean that constitutionalism prevails in that country. There are many countries in the world, past and present, where constitution prevailed, but to the absence of constitutionalism. We may refer to Hitler's Nazi Germany. We may refer to Mussolini's Italy. Coming forward, we may also refer to Saddam Hussein's Iraq or Muammar Gaddafi's Libya or for that matter, North Korea. These are countries where a strict constitution prevails. Even in the communist countries being run by one political party, that is the communist party, there were constitutions. But constitutionalism as such, while we understand from the prevailing practices in the democratic countries, were not present. Constitutionalism requires, apart from the constitution, certain other components on the basis of which only we can call it constitutionalism. For example, to me, limited government is one of the essence of constitutionalism. When we talk about the dictators, authoritarian rulers, one-party systems of governance, there you do not know what would be the next step of the ruler. What would be the next step tomorrow morning? It could be anything. It depends on the whims and the arrogance of the ruler. That is not a dimension of what we call it as limited government. That is a phenomenon of unlimited government to say, where governance has no limits. 
government can touch each and every aspect of your life. All things we consider as private would be public. And all those things we consider as public would be converted into private domain in a, an authoritarian or totalitarian system. So to me, constitutionalism demands that there must be a limited form of government. The government whose boundaries are well defined the government which does not cross the limit and maintains the Lakshman Rekha of administration and politics. Now, apart from limited government, you must have access to fundamental rights. Straightway, you may not have a Fundamental Right Charter. Great Britain does not have a Charter of Fundamental Rights. But there is a system, as we all know, we call it Rule of Law, by which the country is governed. It is particularly because of the presence of the doctrine of Rule of Law that it amounts to the presence of a Charter of Fundamental Rights. Rule of Law means rule of law, that you are being governed by law only. And that is another prerequisite of constitutionalism. Moreover, you see, in constitutionalism, we also prefer decentralization of power and allocation of power to that particular structures of the governance which will exercise it. It's not that if a mass of everything, it's not that I do everything in the system. My job is to be confined to a particular dimension and at the same time, I will have a cooperation between the two or amongst the all. So I will do my responsibility maintaining the overall constitutional cooperation with the rest of the other structures in the system. Therefore, you see, in all kinds of components that I just referred to as limited government, fundamental rights, rule of law, freedom of judiciary, etc., etc., including that of decentralization of power, complete the full process of constitutionalism. Now we come to that of rationalism as such. My argument is that the constitution of India, when it was placed before us, it was not only a legal political document, but at the same time, it was also a rational document to say why it is rational. It was rational because the framers of the constitution presented before us a constitution which, in spite of various schools of criticism, addressed some of the fundamental issues of the polity in India. I will pick up one particular consideration that I will call rational, and that is democracy. Indian constitution is rational because the framers decided to put democracy as one of the basics of the whole constitutional system. Now the question is, why democracy is considered to be rational? Democracy is considered to be rational because only when democracy prevails, the constitution survives in the long run. 
you can just see the, the scenario in the Indian subcontinent. You can think about Pakistan, you can think about Afghanistan, you can think about Nepal, Sri Lanka, whatever it is in the Indian subcontinent, you will find that in no country in Indian subcontinent except India, constitution survived in its original format because at one point of time or other, those documents and the spirit of those documents were hijacked by various political forces which did not promote democracy. Coming to that of Indian constitution, which provided the basics of democracy, democracy has continued. There are hundreds of amendments to the constitutional document, but the spirit remains the same. So my argument is, rational, the constitution of India, in the sense that it incorporated the spirit and the provisions of democracy. Now, simply because the framers of the constitution incorporated the term democracy, can we call it a democracy? Such kind of preferences are there in many constitutions in the world, particularly in the authoritarian and totalitarian constitutions. We find so many references, but do those provisions actually survive in the body politic? No. These are mere cosmetic arrangements, and we do not find the substance of it in the actuality of the functioning of the political system. That is why absence of rationalism in the governing document leads towards a situation of political collapse, ideological bankruptcy, and the overall paralysis of the entire administrative system. You refer to the authoritarian and the totalitarian system at one point of time, you will feel it is a day for everything. It is a day for authoritarianism, for totalitarianism. Think about Hitler at one point of time. It was as if he was the state of Germany. It was as if that the entire populace of Germany was behind him. Was it really so? Same thing happened in Mussolini's Italy or in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. So my point is, in spite of their constitutional commitment, which is purely cosmetic in nature, to that of rule of law, to that of fundamental rights, to the race and leisure of the people, practically everything was based on the whims and the arrogance of the ruler. So none of these systems survived. But when it is a case of democracy, you think about Great Britain, think about US, think about France, think about India. Problems are there, both in terms of structure, in ideology, in actual practices. Many problems are there even in those systems. But the system has remained in broad form in the same. The people have the right to alter governmental system through adult franchise. So it is rational. The people can live a life on their own with a full charter of fundamental rights for the protection of which you have an independent judiciary. Therefore, your mandate is clear. You are an independent citizen of the country. You can live your life on your own without violating the rights of others in the system. 
And these are not mere declaration that you have long list of rights. But there is a protection machinery in the form of the Supreme Court of India. Judicial machinery is there or judicial mechanism is there. Apart from that, you have extraordinary judicial remedies in the form of writs. Habeas corpus, mandamus, co warrant, certiorari, prohibition. These are extraordinary judicial remedy. In normal course, you cannot straight away go to the Supreme Court. But, but if your rights are violated, rights are very sacred in this system. If your rights are violated, you can straight away go to the Supreme Court under Article 32 of the Constitution picking up habeas corpus or any other reads relevant to your case. Therefore, when you have a broad parameter here, which ensure your access to the democratic system, the framers of the constitution decided in right direction, in right time, there were many criticisms against the decision of the framers of the government of the constitution of India. What were the criticisms as such? One of the fundamental criticism against the decision of the framers to go for a parliamentary democratic system was that we were under a colonial rule under compulsion and once freedom is secure, we have adopted the same system of governance for us. Is it fine with the framers? Have they done the right thing for the people of India? But finally, what we see, that the spirit of democracy that have been incorporated in the constitution of India Certain fundamental modifications have been made even with the British system, which is the original model that has been taken up here. In Great Britain, you have a hereditary monarch. But here in India, the head of the state, the president of India, is not a hereditary monarch. It's a rational decision on the part of the framers of the constitution to have an elected to have an elected representative for the same so it is in this context my argument is that the constitution of india that was framed by the framers through the avenue of the constituent assembly was a rational document and it is mainly because of the rationalism incorporated in it that the constitution is surviving even today. Now the thing is, this rational presence of certain components in the constitutional document, in course of time, have been subjected to challenges from many fronts. Challenges are there. I remember in 1976, the then government proclaimed emergency. Emergency was a constitutional measure, no doubt. Under Article 352 of the Constitution, national emergency was proclaimed. But once the national emergency was proclaimed, the very nature of the entire constitutional structure was sought to be converted into an authoritarian system by the then government. That was a major challenge. The people had lost faith in the democratic system. The, the judiciary was not in a position to protect the rights and liberty of the people because under presidential proclamation, the judiciary was deprived of the basic privilege to protect the rights and liberty of the people. It was a serious kind of situation. But at the same time, you know, 
In democracy, the rulers are not eternal rulers. I, I just, a few minutes before I referred to adult franchise, the people have the right to change the government. So finally, when in 1977, there was an election, the people for the first time voted for a non-Congress party. From 1950-51, first general election to 1977, continuously the Congress was in power at the center. There was no unified challenge against the Congress rule. There were so many opposition parties. They could not unite against the Congress. Congress survived in power for a long time. But when the party in power created a situation whereby the fundamental character of the constitution was sought to be converted, the people did not tolerate it. The people exercised their verdict and accordingly for the first time a non-Congress party, the Janata party, that was formed overnight, overnight to say, was elected to power. So my second argument, anyone challenging the rational premise of the constitution would not be tolerated by the people of India. It is true, peaceful method itself, that right answer was given to those forces at the right time. The system prevailed. We, we remember a very dark chapter in the Constitution of India in the form of 42nd Amendment. Prior to that, there were the 39 amendments 39th Amendment. In some of these amendments, some such provisions were sought to be incorporated that the positions like Prime Minister, if anything is done during the time of their tenure in office, would be beyond the jurisdiction of judiciary, outside the purview of judiciary. The people did not tolerate it. Finally, these provisions were completely removed from the Constitution of India. So anything irrational, that is anything undemocratic, which is a challenge to the constitutional system for the long run, will not be accepted by the people. The people will go against it through peaceful method. What is needed at the hour is a scientific approach towards the whole provisions of the Constitution of India. I call it the need for our is a scientific approach because one thing we think is very much missing in the constitutional document in India is the right of the marginal people to participate in the system. Participation is all that they can do it through vote. But mere political participation is not enough. What we need is a meaningful sort of participation through empowerment. We, in terms of theory, call it multiculturalism. Multiculturalism does not mean we have 50 cultural components, cultural streams in India. One, two, three, 50, say suppose. 50 is multi, so multicultural, no. Simply because many cultures exist, it is not multicultural. Multiculturalism indicates an ambience in the polity whereby these marginal people have the empowered situation to participate and to take decisions. Grassroots is an important component. 
mere political participation through panchayats or urban local bodies is not sufficient. You have a an ambience, a structural position outside those formal structures of panchayats and urban local bodies. And that is the, the spirit of the people in the grassroots level. How do they participate in the system? How do they empower themselves? How do they survive? So these sections of the people, their rights, their access to an empowered situation is the need of the hour. Because my argument is this, that the overall stability of the political and the constitutional system has been ensured by the people themselves. But if there is a challenge to the very existence of the people, how will they maintain the constitutional balance? How will they safeguard when they themselves are in peril? And for that, multicultural rights in the real sense is highly needed. So, my broad argument is this, that whatever provisions in terms of democracy were incorporated by the framers, they were mostly democratic and rational in nature. Second, any attempt on the part of the authority the government, the regime, <clears throat> to disturb the democratic balance or to say the rational balance of the constitutional document has been rebutted back by the people of the country. The people have thrown out those provisions and they have restored the original beauty of the policy. And third, I plead for a scientific approach to be adopted to provide multicultural rights in the real sense of the term to the people in the grassroots. Simply because there are many cultures, it is not multiculturalism. Multiculturalism relates to an ambience in which the people in the grassroots are in a position to take decisions. And those decisions will be part of the overall structure of the system. So with this, I, I think I have shared my views on it. And grateful to the organizers once again for giving me this opportunity to be here with my family. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for such a stimulating and uh, thought-provoking lecture. Uh, we all stand, we surely all stand greatly benefited from listening to your lecture, which indeed has uh, covered so many uh, dimensions and so many facets of the polity in India, um, steeped as it is in a strong and vibrant democratic culture and ethos. You have uh, rightly mentioned, or you have rightly pointed out how constitutionalism is actually independent of the existence of constitutions. Uh, constitution, existence of constitutions uh, does not necessarily mean that there would be constitutionalism. Um, so, and you also talked about uh, how the Indian constitution is rational in the sense that it gives center stage to democracy or to the spirit of democracy. And you've also talked about how constitutionalism uh, incorporates certain important components such as limited government and more importantly rule of law and uh, we have also stated that uh, any attempt to disturb the democratic foundation of the Indian constitution 
and the Indian polity, for that matter, is uh, it does not actually go down well with the people. Uh, so and so, what is of paramount importance is to protect and consolidate and strengthen the democratic foundation of the Indian polity, which actually again is determined by the spirit of constitutionalism in India. Thank you very much, sir, for your wonderful lecture. Uh, may I now request Professor N.N. Soma, sir, to kindly deliver the presidential address. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ravijit. Thank you, Dr. Urubhuti Chaudhuri, sir, for a wonderful lecture. And I was keenly listening to your various dispositions, more specifically the articulations, the arguments, and your second argument about maintenance of the democratic balance in the context of 1977 elections, because we witnessed that period. And your argument has given a new insight to look at the rational power of our Indian constitution. We experienced that phase, and when emergency was proclaimed, as, as you have pointed out, at that time the judiciary's role was limited and everything got disrupted and people were helpless. But within a period of about say three months after the withdrawal of the emergency, a new government took oath and that was a, that broke a tradition of about 25 years. And the constitution of India gave the power to the citizens of the country. And that's a, something right, which I did not think of it from that perspective. We were thinking of it that the emergency was declared and there was a massive campaign right? and there was unrest and ultimately people decided about that. But I did not think it from the perspective of the framing of the constitutions, how rational they were at that time in 19, the late 1940s and the way the constitution was framed, the way the entire structure was uh, framed. And you have rightly mentioned about the rational principles the adopter, the framers of our constitution right, amalgamated at that point of time. So we are indeed highly benefited from your these three arguments. And more specifically, you have also given a light about the future prospects in terms of imbibing the spirit of multiculturalism. And I think our constitution of India has enough provisions. More specifically, we need some pragmatic practices how to uh, include the grassroots level citizens into the entire process. We are indeed thankful to Sodri sir for the, this wonderful lecture. At the same time, we are also thankful to Sri Jagumar Bhuya School of Social Sciences. Every year they have been organizing this constitution day. This year also has been no exceptions. And I look forward to similar kind of discourses in future also. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening and enriching words. Uh, Abhijit. Sir. Abhijit. Sir. I, actually, I didn't know Harma sir was presiding over the program. Okay, sir. Actually, I did not know him. So I did not address him, actually. I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay, Mr. Last minute has been to Richard, as you know. <laughs> sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, so, so uh, we have almost come to the end of today's program. May I now request uh, Ms. Krishangi Saikya to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, Krishangi. A very good afternoon to all. I would like to take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to our respected Vice Chancellor, Sir, Professor Rajendra Prasad Das for allowing us to conduct this talk and in guiding us every step of the way. Also, our heartfelt thanks to Professor N.N. Sharma, sir, for delivering the presidential address. On behalf of the Fuja Kumar Bhuya School of Social Sciences and the Discipline of Political Science, Krishnakanta Hendrik State Open University, I express my heartfelt thanks to Professor Aurobjuti Chaudhuri, sir, for gracing us with his presence and illuminating our minds with relevant knowledge on the relationship between constitutionalism and rationalism. On this auspicious occasion, the importance of understanding the stability of the constitutional system in a democratic country like ours 
and the rational value of the Constitution of India is indeed pertinent. We are grateful to you, sir, for enlightening for enlightening us with this talk, and we hope that it was a wonderful homecoming for you as well, sir. Uh, we would also like to thank respected faculty members, officials, and staff for being patient audience of this event. Technical members of the Electronic Media Production Center and the IT cell of KKHSU are highly appreciated for rendering all the necessary help. We hope we can continue to strive to conduct such intriguing events in the near future as well. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We then conclude the meeting now. Thank yeah, you. Thank you.